we offer these kinds of social workshops. We offer um, different design and consultation strategies for people. We also do public speaking and events. And the main thing that we do is these training courses and consultations and designs. So if you're interested in this kind of work in a much more detailed way, we offer this two week intensive course that hopefully will still be able to happen in August. Um, what we're doing right now is for anyone who does register, if we do have to cancel the course because of COVID, you get a full refund. So there's no risk in registering and we are filling up. We've only got about nine spaces left. Um, so there is an option to get in there and learn. And this is where we really get into the, you know, the fundamentals of it, the ecosystem understanding with water, with trees, with soil. We do a full six hour uh, course on soil, do a full six hour course on uh, earthworks and manipulation of the land to develop passive irrigation strategies. We go into dry land, humid tropics, and so on. I don't want to spend too much time selling to you, but the idea is that if you do want to go deeper, you can. There's a lot of resources out there. And at the end of this slideshow, I've added a few different slides here, and they're not perfectly formatted, but they're just there for you to have links and ideas to delve into later on, like the Inhabit, the movie, Dirt, the movie, Symphony of Soil. These are all really great documentaries. Uh, if you want to look at food forest, there's a 2000 year old food forest in Morocco and so many other links. So it's three pages. And this one is the local Montreal uh, resources for those of you who are uh, based in Montreal area. So that is it for the content that we have on the slides. I would like to go back and uh, address the questions that have come through in the last half of this workshop. And uh, so we have, first of all, uh, La Chèvre Noire 23. Also, if I mispronounce your name, I'm sorry. Um, yeah, so thermal mass, this is the thermal mass of the bricks in those fruit walls. This is what holds the heat during the day, and then it releases that heat over the nighttime, which means the night cold temperatures don't get as low. And so uh, you can actually grow um, different uh, fruit trees and things like that that will not normally grow in your climate if you have the right microclimate conditions around them. And thermal mass is one of the biggest things that we play with to bend the rules of the, of the microclimate. Um, so, Annie, uh, I, uh, no, I, I Manatu says uh, that they're looking for specifically tips on urban farming. So, uh, the workshop that the urban permaculture one is much more than just farming and agriculture. I know that I, I touched on some of that, but it's also about the social and the urban setting. So, I apologize if it wasn't fully uh, what you're looking for. Email us and we will uh, discuss and figure out what we can do about that. Um, if you're looking for um, self-watering pots yeah so we covered that the vermicomposting this is one where if you so basically a vermicomposter is a colony of worms it's really um, you what I would like to demystify with it is it's a lot easier than it looks vermiculture worms they like to live in top 10 centimeters of soil so they live in in bins very easily they don't need to go deep they're not like earthworms Earthworms need to go up to like 15 meters in depth uh, and they eat meat and the, well not meat but animal parts and things like that so they're not what you actually want in a composting worm system and the worms they are finicky so I would even call it more a worm farm than a vermicomposter because they eat only specific food types they don't eat onions they don't eat garlic they don't eat oil they don't eat bread they don't eat chili peppers um, and so they have a diet that you have to follow. But I specifically have them because they produce a living, like crawling soil. Like when you pull this up out of the bin, it's got things that are scurrying away. It's got all kinds of the different soil profile that we want to have a living soil food web, which we, we don't talk about in this course, but we do talk about in the fundamentals of permaculture or the permaculture course. So the vermicomposter, there's many different ways of doing it with a bin. Um, the key is to have lots of shredded paper for bedding and whenever this is the one key that I find most people get wrong when you're gonna bury when you're gonna feed them you dig a hole and you bury your food at least three inches below the surface if any of the food is visible flies will find it fruit flies will find it and then you have a problem right so that's that's a huge uh, no no you have to always always bury your um, your food scraps if you freeze the food scraps the worms can eat them faster because the freezing causes the cells to rupture so what I do when I'm in vermicompost production uh, my old apartment we had a food processor where we would throw all the food scraps and chop them all up and then freeze them 
in portions, and then we would give thaw it first. Don't give them a frozen portion; they won't like you. Uh, thaw it first, and then give them. It's, I know it looks gross, but because it's been chopped up in small pieces and frozen, they will chew through that in no time. Um, they also love coffee, and that makes them work harder. So it's a good thing to add to your mix. Um, we're actually putting together a uh, DIY vermiculture guide. It's not something that we, we do it as a hands-on workshop, but it's not something that we spend a lot of time on in a workshop because I don't want to, we get into this uh, research paralysis online very often where you just research and research and research and research. The most important thing with vermicompost is get some worms and we are, we, are, we can sell you the, the starting kit for the worms um, and get started and learn the, the different trials as you, as you go from there. Right? And we have a little guide that will help you get set up with that that uh, should be out in the next few weeks. We also have, um, so detox your air. Okay, so um, Ayamanatu, can you confirm whether all of your questions and needs have been fulfilled? Because this is an important part of all of this too, is that I observe your needs and respond to them adequately. And I know that at first you weren't so sure if this was fulfilling for you or not. So please let us know if you have other questions. Uh, in the chat, and we will answer those. So, um, Joe Big is, and Joe Big is saying, uh, don't want to create a debate. Oh, wait, sorry, okay, never mind, that's fine, I think. Okay, yeah, so thank you, I appreciate that. Um, quick answer, what are we looking for? So, Stacy is saying, try to grow indoor plants or herbs. I get lots of fruit flies no matter what I do. Is there an easy way to avoid this? Now, okay, are they. It's hard to identify because I need a picture of them, but they may not be fruit flies. They may be um, fungus gnats, and I get this too. Whenever, so actually, you you don't see them here because the mulch is dry. But if I put my mate down on the plants wet, and I don't, you can put it wet, but you have to like at the end of the, you have to spread it out. And then the next morning you have to kind of fluff it a bit and fluff it a bit and let it dry properly. Otherwise you will attract fungus gnats and it's because they're eating the fungus that will grow there. And then they're kind of just flying around. They're a little bit more clumsy than a fruit fly. Uh, so if they're fungus gnats, there are beneficial pest predators that you can buy that are actually going to eat the fungus gnats. The other thing that you can do is, where is my neem spray? Uh, it's in the garden shed. Um, oh no, it's right here. So I use a um, pump sprayer, so it's a little little container, you can get it for about $20. You pump it up and pressurize it and then it has a little spraying nozzle. Trust me, if you don't have one of these, you can get even a small one. Um, get one of these because if you're there spritzing your plants, your finger is going to give up on you after a few, few weeks of this. So get one of these pressurized sprayers. You put some of your neem oil. Um, which you can't actually buy as a insecticide in Canada anymore, even though it is a natural insecticide. There's some lobby that of the insect insecticide producers that stopped it. So I got this from Cameroon when I was there working on it, but you can get it online. You put a small teaspoon of this uh, with, I can't remember the measurements, but Castile, like pure, this is Dr. Bronner's uh, Castile soap. So no scent, no nothing. It's completely biodegradable. You mix the two of them in water, and actually, uh, depending on your nozzle size, you can put some cayenne powder in there. But what I recommend first is that you actually take the cayenne powder, infuse it in boiling water, and then filter out the cayenne so it doesn't clog your sprayer on your uh, mister, and then put that water in the mix. So you've got the spice, you've got the neem, which is a uh, insecticide, and then you have the soap, which actually causes the trachids of the insect to uh, not function properly, which is how they breathe. So I know it's not happy, but it, it suffocates them and kills them. So that's a natural insecticide. So in permaculture, we obviously are trying to design ecosystems that will defend and control their own insects naturally. However, there are moments where you have to intervene. And so I will use diatomaceous earth if there is an insect outbreak uh, and I can't get it under control with my natural pest predators. If I have a, you know, we had um, actually, one of our, our plants from the office had gotten an insect, uh, the mealybug. So I just whipped up a bunch of this and I, you know, kill as many as you can see and then soak down the soil and soak down the plant to get it under control because obviously that plant needed to be transplanted and was stressed, right? So this is the other factor is if your plants are getting insects, 
it's not the idea to go to an insecticide is the linear solution like um you know a solution based approach where instead of going for the holistic preventative approach of why is that plant sick all plants have the ability in their bodies in their plant tissue to defend against insects to defend against caterpillars or other things like this by either producing bitter tasting elements or chemicals or whatever else or attracting pest predators so if they're not doing this it's because they are weak and if they are weak it's because they either have roots that are root bound or they dry out too much so if you ever had spider mites on your plants they love drought so it's because your plants are drying getting too dry uh, if you have uh, you know, some insects are loving the, the root rot. Um, so there's all kinds of different conditions, but most of them are related to the stress of the plant. And so if we can reply to the needs of the plant and fulfill its baseline growing conditions so that it's as happy and healthy as possible, which starts with the soil, to be honest, it's living soil, then we can uh, fulfill the needs of the plant and it won't actually need pest control because it'll take care of itself. If it is fruit fly, then this is because you have either a compost bin nearby or you are putting, so sometimes I would suggest the, uh, the mate or you can also put green tea leaves or black tea leaves. But if you do that and you have like a peach green tea, well the peach smell is going to attract fruit flies. So I don't know if you can, what I would say, um, Stacy, um, is if you can, Try and Google the difference between a fruit fly and a fungus gnat, it's G-N-A-T. Then you can figure out which of the two of them it is. And then you go down the rabbit hole of, well, what are, you know, what are the causal factors? What are the reasons why this is there? And if you can't get ahead of the game with that, send us a question at info at p3permaculture.ca and I'll have uh, either Diana or Clementine or myself answer you uh, to the best of our ability. So moving along, um, do we have any other? Oh, okay. So oh, thank you, Dan. Dan's posted actually a link in the chat for a uh, hack for fruit flies. And we want, uh, so Stacy has, where do you get your mushroom spawn? So right now, um, it, it's hard to get mushroom spawn because <laughs> I normally go to Miko Boutique. Uh, which is on Saint-Denis, and they have all kinds of really good mushroom spawn. If I'm doing a mushroom cultivation workshop and I have uh, a large attendance of students who are all taking home a mushroom kit, I will make an order from Field and Forest Products, which is actually from the U.S., but they have incredibly good quality mushrooms. Um, but I do prefer to support the local suppliers uh, as much as possible, and Miku Boutique is a great one. And then there's also Vincent Leblanc, uh, who has a company called Violon et Champignon, and they actually produce malt, uh, mushroom spawn, but they only do it in springtime. They only do it at a certain time of year. So it depends. Um, once you have, have your mushrooms set up, like we have in Wakefield at our demonstration property and our partnership with the El Paquiad farm, we have a food forest there where there is um, the wine caps trephoria mushrooms, and they're everywhere. So I can take a, a handful of that mycelium and now this is my spawn for the new areas that I'm growing. So I can take that home and actually put that in my garden bed and use it uh, however I want. So there's ways of, of doing that. And then worst case scenario, like right now, I'm planning on growing mushrooms because it's I already missed, you know, with the last cold rainy weeks, these were the best weeks for it. But I've been, uh, I had found mushrooms on sale in the grocery store, oyster mushrooms, that were starting to get white fuzz on them. And as long as it's not black, green, or yellow, or pink, it's just the white fuzz. It's actually the mushrooms that when they realize they can't sporulate properly, they will uh, self-destruct and start to consume themselves and produce new mycelial hyphae. And that they're basically gonna try and recolonize and try again. So when you see them getting fuzzy like that, you can actually take those and then take some newspaper or not newspaper, take, take a cardboard. Cardboard's better, it has less risk of contamination. Uh, wet it down with some water and hydrogen peroxide. Hydrogen peroxide will be a light pasteurization. And then you can let it grow into that cardboard. Um, or you can you know, go with the wood chip pellets or um, pine straw and things like that. Straw is a little harder to find in the city. But these, um, 
the wood chip pellets are pretty easy to find because a lot of people still have fireplaces that use them. So you can create your own spawn is what I'm saying. And otherwise you can sometimes get it online, but things are a little harder to get online these days. So are there any other questions uh, that people want to drop in the chat before we close it up for the day? Yeah, no problem, Stacy. It's a pleasure. And it, I know it can be daunting at first. Um, so there's, you know, we actually have, um, we have a running suppliers list, which is just a Google Excel spreadsheet that we share with people. So it, uh, all we ask is that you add your suppliers to it too. So it becomes like a global, not a global, it's a, cre it's a creative document that we are growing together. Um, Mario is saying, or Nick, Nick Mario? Uh, is saying that they have, what do we think about planting seeds in Ramea mulch? So if you're going to plant in mulch, and I'll give you a little demo here. Imagine this is your big heavy garden and these are wood chips. You can't plant directly in because the wood chips are too heavy, right? If it's, um, if it's shredded like this, the seeds will go through no problem. And some seeds like beans, they'll push through the wood chips. Some seedlings have a tough enough stem, they'll do it. But some of the tiny little ones, you basically like a, a lettuce seed. Lettuce seed is supposed to be, most seeds are supposed to be twice the size of the seed deep into the soil. So a lettuce seed means you basically blow on it and it's at the right depth. So if you're below a wood chip, it's never going to come up and through. And so what I do in those areas is I will, hopefully you can see this, I'll clear out an area down to the soil. Actually, that has I have to go down a fair bit here. And then I will put back a soil in that area that I have sifted and I use just like a wire mesh to sift out the big chunks of wood chips or whatever else that are in there and get a really nice fine soil and that's what we use for our seedlings and I'll put that down in a patch and then do my fine seedlings in there and I'll usually use like straw or something where I can put a light layer of it over the seed but you just have to watch that area for uh, weeds and it, so once the seedlings come up then you can dress the mulch back, dress the wood chip mulch back. But when it's in those early seedlings that are direct seeded in the ground, you pull the mulch back, expose soil, put some seedling soil in the top, and then let them grow from there. So that's hopefully the answer for you there. But yeah, Ramea um, is a company that produces Ramiol wood chips. So in our, our uh, ecological gardening workshops where we talk more about mulch and wood chips, and in our fundamentals we talk more about mulch, uh, ramiol wood chips are, because there's wood chips, and then there's ramiol, which means that it's a young growth. So there's more nitrogen material in the leaf, or in the leaves and in the branches. So it means that the carbon-nitrogen ratio is more balanced, and it will make for a faster decomposition. And it's through the decomposition that we feed the organisms that feed the plants. So ramiol wood chips are better for your garden than wood chips but they're also more expensive. If you get them from Ramea, if you can't buy a bulk load, you've got to get it from like Jardin Jasmin, and it's like $8 for a little 20 liter bag. So it adds up. Um, what I prefer is to grow plants in my garden that I cut and use for mulch. And so if you have a big enough garden and you're not in the city, I use willow. And it's not like a tree willow, it's a shrub willow, and then you just cut it every year and then rent a chipper and chip it all up and make your own. Uh, or I'll use, um, in the urban settings, I'll use ornamental grasses. And make sure you get the clumping grasses because they don't spread. And then you keep that grass all winter and it's an amazing habitat. One meter squared of dense grasses can hold up to 1,500 pest predators, like 1500, 0, 0. 1,500 pest predators can be in that one meter squared. So it's a great habitat for pest control. And then in the spring, I will chop down, not all the way, but chop down half of that grass and, uh, and then shred that up and I have a bit of a mulch supply for my, for my garden. Oh, okay, so Mario, yeah, you had some, uh, or Nick, Nick and Mario had some issue with the seeds coming up. So yeah, if there's small seeds under the wood chips, you're gonna have some issue. But you know, like big beans, scarlet runner beans, they should be fine. Uh, vermiculite good to put on top of the, the seedling. I've used it for inside. Uh, and works good. Uh, yes, but you don't need, um, oh, you mean as like a mulch? Yeah, you could. Um, 
it's also a cost benefit, right? Like how big is your garden space and uh, how much you know mulching do you have to do? Uh, if you have a small space, you can probably drink enough green tea or mate um, to produce that kind of mulch for like indoor potted plants. Uh, if it's a fairly big balcony garden, then yeah, you're going to buy something. Um, vermiculite, it would work as a, yeah, this is, how much time do we have? Uh, so basically vermiculite yeah, exactly. It cakes when wet, so if it can stay fluffed, that's good. It'll prevent evaporation, but it's a mineral base, and therefore it's not carbon-based, and therefore it will not feed the fungi and the bacteria in the soil, and therefore it will not keep a living soil system healthy. The reason why we use organic carbon-based mulches is, and this is stuff we would cover in a, the intensive soil section, carbon is the main food element for fungi and bacteria which are the main food elements for the rest of the food chain in the soil and that is how basically their wastes and exudates will feed the soil and keep the plant healthy and so we want something that the worms can eat that the fungi can eat and that the bacteria can eat so it will break down and feed the soil so it's not just preventing weeds it's preventing evaporation and preventing weeds and that the vermiculite might work um, except for the caking the, the problem that it can have but it will not feed the soil. So you're gonna, you're gonna have uh, the soil not getting better and better over time, right? And, and like, you know, just, just leaves. We had only access to leaves last year. We weren't able to get any wood chips. And we just shredded that up and put it on our garden. And there's, there's now areas where I'll see like a pile of leaves and I'll, I think it's just a bigger pile and I'll try and spread it out and then open it and it's like a mound of earthworm castings and there's like a colony of them that have created this little mound in the garden. Uh, so we've seen the, the pollinators, the worms, there's all kinds of things that have come back just by one beneficial, one treatment of organic matter, right? So the key here is not just the preventing weeds and evaporation, but also feeding that soil because the more you feed the soil, the less pests you'll have, the less disease you'll have, the tastier your vegetables will be, the healthier your vegetables vegetables will be, and so on and so forth, without getting into a, a soil course here. Um, yeah, vermiculite is usually mixed into the soil. Same with, with perlite. Actually, you can see here we, we have perlite um, that we use um, that's in the soil. That's mainly for aeration for perlite, and then the vermiculite is actually it holds a bit of moisture um, sometimes, so they, they have a bit of difference. So any other questions here? All right, well, I really appreciate all of your time and your patience today with all of this. I hopefully fulfilled your needs and your answers. Uh, like I said, if there's questions that come up afterwards, and there will, uh, send us an email. If we can answer those uh, in a timely fashion, we will. If not, sometimes, especially having to relearn it, doing everything online, this takes a little longer. So there may be a bit of delay in our reply, but we will get to you. Um, so send us an email or, or a message on uh, on Facebook, and uh, we'll hopefully be able to answer those questions. Oh, oh, we have questions. Okay, <laughs> see, I, I scared y'all. Now you got questions. Okay, what do we got? Um, putting veggie veggie rest into the soil is that veggie residue? Oh, I think. Are you um, talking about when people dig and put kitchen scraps underground and then bury it? Is this what you're talking about? Yeah, so permaculture is based on observing nature, right? When in nature do you see creatures digging underground and putting lots of vegetables or lots of, well, you don't see vegetables very much except for seeds, and that's because seeds keep well underground and you can go back and eat them. But if you're trying to have it decompose uh, by what happens, like think about a, a wolf, a wolf will take a portion of the deer that it killed in the winter, dig a hole and bury it underground, and it will ferment, and it's part of that fermentation process that helps them actually get a better meal in the long run, but it's not going to break down properly. So what you actually want to do is you want to, um, uh, you want to compost it properly. So you need to add carbon and nitrogen, right? So you can't, you have to compost it on the side and then add it back. You can do it in layers. You can put veggies and then carbon and veggies and carbon. Um, 
Yeah, sorry, I just saw some questions here. Okay, so yeah, you can, put, you can put your veggie scraps and then carbon and veggie scraps, and that's basically a lasagna garden, and that works. But you have to keep your carbon, like twice as much carbon, shredded leaves or straw or shredded cardboard or something like that, to one portion. So it's a two to one, twice as much carbon for every one portion of kitchen scraps. And if it's too wet and not enough air, it'll smell bad. And if it ever smells bad, that's your nose telling you that there are diseases and pathogens in there that are bad for the garden. And if you have, if anyone's ever had compost piles that are stinky, that smell bad, you can actually kill your plants by putting that on the garden. So don't. Uh, compost, when it's done properly, uh, and actually the word compost means an aerobic decomposition, it's not stinky. It smells good. Uh, it smells like a forest kind of floor soil. So you don't want to dig it underground. You could have a pile of wood chips, and this is actually a technique for composting, or lazy composting, have a pile of wood chips or a pile of straw or a pile of leaves and dig into that and put your kitchen scraps and then bury it over. And when you've done this and you have no more spots left in your pile, then you can start composting it. That's a technique that we teach. But uh, no, don't dig it into the ground. Um, Jamzy83 is saying, can I use cedar mulch between my garden rows? So the controversy with cedar mulch is, is it black, red, or natural? Because the black and the red ones, there's a, science, uh, a scientific study that showed that the dye leaches out of, because it's not natural coloring, it's a, it's a, it's a chemical coloring, is, uh, is leaches out of the plants and actually sorry out of the wood chips and can get into the soil and get into the plants and this has not been tested for food consumption right so that's a no-no the second thing about cedar is that cedar has um has phenolics has um, essential oils in it that are antifungal meaning they kill mushrooms right and remember when we have carbon which is our wood chips the two main things that eat the carbon right away are bacteria and fungi. And so if we're using cedar, we're killing out or inhibiting, we won't kill because I've grown mushrooms. I've seen, I have a friend who's grown mushrooms in wood, cedar wood chips, um, but it inhibits the fungal growth and that stresses the soil. So we can use cedar wood chips in the pathway, but don't use the red or the black ones. And um, it's better, if you can, well, if you can compost them over time in the pathway, or if you can compost them ahead of time before, that's good. But um, if you can't find other wood chips, then okay, cedar is, is not the end of the world. It's better than nothing, um, but it's not the best option at all. Um, so, hold on, we have... What about the dye in the geotextile? Yeah, absolutely. And honestly, um, Nick Mario, this is one of the ones that I'm not so sure about. So I'm, I like these ones because they're light colored. Um, so it's more, but it is a polypropylene fiber, right? It's a plastic fiber, which I don't like. Um, I have done them before with cotton and it rots before you're halfway through your season. So, when we're working with the geotextile, we're like in between in this world of like, well, we're out of the ground, which is not a natural way to grow plants. Um, the only way that you can do it successfully and be fully natural is, um, well, if you look at a kokodama, it's like a, a ball of clay rich soil that has moss around it. And then you wrap it in a hemp string or jute string. And so that becomes a aerated root ball but you're not going to do that for all your veggies. Um, and it dries out really quickly because there's no reservoir for it. I guess you could try and connect it to a reservoir. Um, but the, the, yeah, the geotextile, that's a problem. That's definitely a problem. And I don't know exactly what to do. This stuff is, uh, is you know, it's affordable, but it's plastic. And it's my, not microfiber, but it's small fiber plastic. So I don't, I don't have a solution for that. If anyone does, please drop it in the comments. Um, but yeah. So what's the next question here? Um, is it okay to put around my berry bushes? So same thing with your berry bushes, right? Because anytime we have uh, low quality soil, we have a higher risk for disease and a higher risk for pests and insects. And so your berry bushes are gonna really love it if it's not, if it's decomposing 
quickly because that's going to feed the soil and you can do a, you know do a side by side do one bush with cedar and do one bush with a mixed wood chip mulch because the other issue here is that we're just using cedar whereas the wood chip mulch that you can get from uh, the Zimoldar or the, um, the tree pruning companies that is a mix it's got maybe a bit of cedar it's got a bunch of you know, uh, uh, maple it's got a bunch of poplar it's got a bunch of other things in it and that means you have a diversity of nutrients we look at one of the principles of permaculture it's to diversify so that's another issue with cedar is that it's just cedar so there's some things it's really good for and some things it's not good for at all and so if you're going to use cedar mix it with shredded leaves or what i like to do sometimes is i'll have my nice wood chip mulch on the top and so i'll clear it on this away and then put the ugly mulch like the shredded leaves and whatever else down and then put the wood chips over top so it kind of looks nice um, but you hide all the random stuff but you have now a diversity of carbon in your wood chips or in your mulch pile um <laughs> you're, you're stopping the questions Nick Maya? all right okay that's all right the questions are great i'm sure everybody else is also having uh you know, it helps everyone else get a little more out of this. Um, cedar, oh yeah, the cedar mulch, yes, okay, and uh, you should get this in Champ. Yeah, actually, when I was in France doing a project there, and we were in the nursery, they had like eight different kinds of carbon-based uh, mulch, and one of them was shredded chanf, sh shredded hemp, and it, it, it looks just like the mate. It, it looks amazing. Um, but I think actually maybe you're referring to a hemp-based uh, fiber. Yeah, I mean, I think if we made these thick enough, it, they wouldn't, wouldn't break down over one season. But the problem is, is like even you look at this one, I don't want to drip it over my keyboard, but you can see already it's water stained and this is just one year. And so it's in constant humidity and that will cause uh, any organic, chemical, or organic tissue to break down. So the like... If we look at the the old towel that I'm using on the bottom, they actually start to rot uh, over time and you have to replace them. So, you know, you can do that. It just means a little bit more work of replacing them. The key is we don't want it to need to be replaced halfway through the season when the tomatoes are big and full of fruit, right? We want it to last at least one season. Um, and I, yeah, it's hard to do redo everything every year. It becomes a lot of work. So, uh, ash from the fire pit. Okay, so ash is got carbon in it but it is very low carbon because it's mostly what's left over it's very alkaline so acidic and alkaline right the opposite on the ph or the acidity spectrum um, alkaline isn't good for a lot of plants some plants love it like thistles but you can actually cause it to burn the roots of a lot of plants so the main issue is that it dissolves very quickly in the water and you can actually if you take white uh, wood ash and soak it in or, or rinse it with water you can make lye which will melt your skin right that's how we make soap because you have to make lye from the wood ash well traditionally um, so that you imagine if it melts your skin it can melt the roots so wood ash in a extremely acidic soil some people will use it to bring the ph back up uh, which puts uh sorry the ph back up which brings the alkalinity down right so it balances it balances the pH, changes it from acidic to alkaline, but it's usually faster than the plants want. And this is again another soil thing, um, but plants, if they have, um, if they want a different mineral nutrient and they need the soil to be a little more alkaline or a little more acidic for their specific needs, they will actually exude sugars in their roots and plants will, of their lifespan, exude 70% of all the sugars that the plant produces it will exude into the soil to attract bacteria and fungi. And by doing so, it actually will uh, attract a fungi or a bacteria that will change the pH around the soil roots, the roots of, uh, in the soil, so that way that plant can use the different pHs that it needs. So plants will actually change the pH of the soil all that they want, as long as they have bacteria and fungi, which means the soil needs carbon, right? So again, you can see me coming back again and again to the carbon cycle, because to give you an idea, just a, an idea of carbon. So in, in Cameroon, I was consulting on a farm that had just clear cut uh, the rainforest. Now I had no control over this. There was a new farm that they were putting in. So this is what we were dealing with. And when we were cooking our food, we had three logs and a pot on top for cooking the rice and beans. 
And at day one, the, the fire was at ground level. At day two, there was a little bit of a pit. Day three, there was about six inches. And after a week, we had a foot and a half hole that we had to actually fill back in because the coals were getting too far away from the cook pot and we weren't cooking anything. So in that soil, how can you burn a hole a uh, foot and a half deep if soil is minerals like sand, silt, and clay, and you know, two to three percent organic matter, which many soil scientists will tell you three percent for five percent organic matter is too much. Well, that soil that just came out of the rainforest was 90 percent carbon, right? That's what was burning, and the clay and the silt and the sand are all still there. So, some of the healthiest soils in the world have incredibly high amounts of organic matter. So, this is really one of the root core elements of soil health is that organic matter and so yeah to get back to the, the ash and fire pit if you want to use ash for a change in ph it's better to feed the soil and let the soil and the plants figure out it out for themselves is that uh does that answer your question Nancy? hopefully anyway let us know send us uh comments and questions concerns and everything else and I will hope to see you at the next one and hope it's in person so that I can actually get to meet you beautiful people and hear about all your awesome projects. Thank you so much and see you at the next one.